All right, this is still Unit 3. We are going to be covering Chapter 6. In Chapter 6, we are getting into discrete probability distributions, and really we're just going to be covering the binomial distribution. However, if you look through the book, there are other distributions that we just don't have time to get to. So I don't want you to think that the binomial is the only discrete probability distribution. There are many others, but we are just going to cover the binomial because it is um, the most common one that we'll see. So what we have to do first is just go over some terms because, hey, we haven't even talked about uh, discrete probability distributions or discrete random variables yet. So we have to define what those are before we can get into the binomial. So a random variable is a quantitative variable whose value depends on chance. Uh, so it's random because we don't know what it's going to be, right? It's variable. Uh, so it's a random variable. When flipping a coin, if the random variable x represents the number of heads in two flips of a coin, the possible values for x are 0, 1, or 2, right? A discrete random variable is a random variable whose possible values can be listed or we usually are going to think of it as a count. So whenever I'm telling my students about discrete or continuous, discrete we want to think of as a count. Continuous, we're thinking about data that can be like anywhere on the number line. So, you know, it could be any point in there. It could have decimals, fractions, whatever. Um, so with discrete, we're thinking of a count. So like how many heads did you get? I got zero, I got one, I got two. Whereas with continuous random variables, if we were asking, um, like how long did you sit in the drive through You could be there 1.5 minutes, you could be there 1.17 minutes, you could be there 2.258 minutes. You know, it just depends on how good your measuring instrument was, right? It could, it could be anywhere on the number line, so it's not just a count. Uh, so we'll deal with <clears throat> continuous random variables um, after this Unit 3 discussion which in my spring class was after spring break. It's kind of the second half uh, of the semester. So identify the following as discrete or continuous. The number of voters, okay, that should clue you in that we're talking about a count. That would be discrete. The length of time in seconds between arrivals, that's going to be continuous. It could be anywhere on the number line. The number of customers waiting to be served in a restaurant, discrete, right? You either have two customers or you have zero customers or you have five customers. You're not going to have 8.25 customers, right? You're going to have one, two, three, whatever, okay? All right, probability distributions here. We already talked about that in chapter five, right? This is a probability distribution because it includes all the possible outcomes for this sample space, uh, all the events that we could have. So if you look at the probability and add them all together, it equals to one, right? Um, what is the random variable? Here we're looking at the number of daily accidents in, an, in a small town, okay? Uh, so the random variable is the number of daily accidents. On any given day, we don't know how many accidents are gonna occur. Is it discrete? Yes, because it's a count, right? You're going to have one accident or two accidents or whatever, right? It's a count. What is the probability a randomly selected day will have four or more accidents? So this is how we denote that. The probability that X, so that's our random variable. Here our random variable is the number of daily accidents, right? So the probability that X is greater than or equal to four because it said four or more, right? So in this case, four or more is four or five, right? Because these are all our possible outcomes. So it's either four or five. So we go to four, the probability of four is this, probability of five is that. We add them together and we get 0.1. What's the probability that they would have less than four? Well, this is where we're gonna start using that complement rule more. So we use the complement rule really to save us time. So here, we do the probability that x is less than 4. Now to figure that out, I could go here and I could add up the probability that x is equal to 3, 2, 1, and 0, right? I don't want to take a ton of time, you know, but still it's going to take a little bit of time. I'm going to go up there and add all four of those together. But if I notice that this is the complement of that, right, because either you've got four or more accidents, or you have less than four, right? This is the opposite of that. So because that is the opposite, that I can use the complement rule 
and do 1 minus 0 0.1 and get 0 0.9. And so there's a 10% chance that we will have four or more accidents. There's a 90% chance that we will have less than four. Okay, so that kind of shows how we're going to use that complement rule with this discrete data. Okay, this is kind of a classic example that we'll see here uh, with the binomial distribution. Uh, we haven't talked about it yet, uh, but when we get into the binomial, we'll see how this fits into that. So when a balanced penny is tossed three times, eight equally likely outcomes are possible. So how do we get to those eight equally likely outcomes? You know, that's just what this question says, but how do we know there are eight? Well, this is what that diagram kind of shows. So this is your first toss. On the first toss, you get heads or tails. Then the second toss, if you got heads the first time, you get heads or tails. If you got tails, you get heads or tails, right? So we're just doing that every time for the first, second, and third toss. At the end, we're going to write, what did we end up getting in this example? So here, we got heads, heads, and heads. That's what that stands for. We're counting the number of heads because it says, let x denote the total number of heads obtained. There's nothing special about heads or tails. You just have to decide which one am I counting? You know, which one am I interested in? Okay, and this one we're interested in heads. Okay, so here we got three heads. Here, heads, heads, tails. So I got two heads. Heads, tails, heads. Two heads, okay? And you'll notice here I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight outcomes, okay? So, um, we're going to construct the probability distribution of x. This is the probability distribution. A probability distribution lists all the possible outcomes and all the probabilities of those outcomes. Okay, we're going to be calculating these probabilities based on classical probability, right? Uh, because we didn't actually do this experiment. We're just saying these are all the possible outcomes. Okay, so we're using classical probability here. So. Uh, one of our possible outcomes is zero, right? We could get zero heads. What's the chance that we would get zero heads? Well, we go back here and we say there's eight total possible outcomes. And one of those, this one right here, has zero heads in it, right? Every other one has at least one head. This one has zero heads, so there's only one outcome that had zero heads. So I have one over eight, and that gives me 0.125. Now I'm looking at what's the chance that I will get one head. So we go up here and we say, well, how many of these had one head? We have one, two, three, right? Three out of a total of eight. So I get 0.375. Okay, and that's how we do this whole chart. And at the end, when I add all these together, I should get to one, right? Uh, because that tells me that I've included all the possible outcomes and I have included their correct probabilities. Now, once we've made this chart, we can answer some questions like this. What is the probability of obtaining exactly two heads and three tosses of the penny? So that's just what's the probability x is equal to 2. I go down here, and it's 0.375, or 3 over 8, right? What is the probability of obtaining no more than two heads and three tosses of the penny? So no more than means less than or equal to two, right? So it means two, one, or zero. So we just add those three together and we get 0.875. Okay, we talked about this concept before, but this is just showing how empirical and classical probability will eventually look very, very similar. So as I increase my number of trials, my empirical probability is going to look almost exactly like that classical probability. This is one we did in our own class kind of to simulate that that um, was the case. Here is the mean and standard deviation of a discrete random variable. So you can calculate the mean and the standard deviation for uh, these probability experiments. So let's calculate the mean and standard deviation uh, of the coin toss experiment. So uh, we made this chart before. This was our probability distribution chart that we made. So uh, to calculate the expected value, uh, which is our mean, so for discrete random variables, we talk about an expected value. Uh, that is the same thing as saying the mean, okay? And we'll talk about how to interpret that in a second. 
But here, all we have to do is take each of the um, possible outcomes and multiply by their probabilities, okay? So here, what I did was I did 0 times 1 over 8, 1 times 3 over 8, etc. And then you add them all together, and we get 1.5. And so that is our mean. Our standard deviation here um, takes a little more work to do, right? First, you have to calculate the expected value, the mean, right? Then you're going to take each of the observations, subtract the mean, square it, and then multiply by the probability of x, add all those together, take the square root, okay? And we get 0.866. But we can do this a little easier uh, by using our calculator. So let's go to STAT. I want to edit. I've got some data in here from before, so I'm going to clear those. Okay, and I'm going to put in my data. So I'm putting in all my possible outcomes, 0, 1, 2, and 3. And then I'm going to put in uh, their probabilities in list 2. Okay, so I'm going to go to stat, and I'm going to calculate I'm going to do one variable stats, but instead of just putting in one list, I'm going to put in two lists. So I'm going to put in L1, comma L2. When I do that, it knows that that second list is my probability or my relative frequency, okay? And so here it gives me my mean, and you notice it only gives me the sigma, not the S. And that's because it knows that this is a probability distribution. And so now I'm looking at a sigma and not an S because this isn't a sample standard deviation. This is a, an entire probability distribution. So we think of those as parameters. Okay, so my X bar, which really is my mu, they just don't write a mu in here. Um, but the mean is 1.5. The sigma is 0.866, which is the same thing we got down there. Now, in some of the other calculators, the the ones, the newer ones that are above this TI-83+, plus, what you'll have is it'll have, uh, it'll say your data, and then it will say something like um, frequency list um, or frequency or something like that. That's where you want to put L2 or that second list that has the probabilities in it. Um, so yours may look a little different, but that's where you want to put the L2 in, and that should give you this information. And then this stuff down here doesn't really matter. We're not really going to use the median. We really just want the mean and the standard deviation. So that's a quick way you can do it um, without having to uh, do it by hand because I know the mean's not too bad, but the standard deviation can get long, especially if you have a lot of possible outcomes. So how should we ter interpret the mean? Okay, uh, it's, it's good to know how to calculate some of these, but in statistics, we really want to work on being able to explain what our answers mean, not just being able to say, yep, I calculated this, here's the answer. You know, being able to say, okay, I got this answer, and this is what that answer means, or this was an unusual answer, or this was an unusual, or whatever. You know, we want to be able to do that. So, what does our mean of 1.5 tell us? Well, remember I said that the mean is also called the expected value, right? So that makes a little more sense when we say the expected value is 1.5. So that means in this experiment, when I flip a coin three times, I should expect to get 1.5 heads. And we probably could have told ourselves that without ever doing any math, right? If I said flip a coin three times, how many heads do you expect to get? You would say, well, you know, I expect to get heads about 50% of the time, so I should get one or two heads, right? Exactly. Yes, we're going to get between one and two heads. So 1.5 heads means I'm going to get about one or two, and that's what that tells me. Now that we've learned some of those um, ideas and some of the stuff of chapter 5, we can start talking about the binomial distribution. So to use the binomial distribution, these conditions have to be true. So on some of your homework problems, the very first part will just be showing that all these things are true, being able to check all these things off, okay? The binomial distribution is usually going to be used when we're talking about the number of successes. So those are kind of the key words that you're looking for to know if you can use a binomial, okay? 
okay? Um, so with the binomial, you want to have a fixed number of observations, which means if I'm going to toss a coin 10 times, I'm going to toss it 10 times every single time I do the experiment, okay? So we're not going to change how many times I toss a coin or flip a, co flip a card or do whatever, okay? Uh, observations are independent. We talked about independence already. Um, independence means the outcome of one trial does not affect the outcome of another trial, okay? For each trial, there are two mutually exclusive or disjoint outcomes. We also talked about mutually exclusive in Chapter 5, right? Uh, so it needs to look like this, right? They need to have nothing in common there. They're mutually exclusive. So examples, you have heads or tails, right? You have one or the other. If I'm rolling a die, let's say I decide uh, six is going to be a success, so I'm going to count the number of sixes. So then I either get a six or I don't get a six. So that's my success or my failure. Um, so we're trying to place everything into a success or failure category, and that's while we're thinking about number of successes here, uh, that's how we're going to calculate our probabilities here. So P is equal to the probability of success. 1 minus P is equal to the probability of failure, and that's because of the complement rule. So because everything is either success or a failure, then we can do this P equals probability of success. 1 minus P equals the probability of failure. There's a constant probability of success for each observation. It does not change from trial to trial. So that means we need to use replacement uh, if we're looking at finite populations. So finite just means countable. If we have a really large population, like all of the U.S. or something like that, um, it doesn't really matter too much if we use replacement or not replacement. Um, but uh, if we have a smaller population, like if I have a class of 30, um, and I don't use replacement, then that's going to change your probability of being chosen each time, right? Your chance of being chosen the first time is 1 out of 30, because there's 30 students. If you're not chosen, your chance of being chosen the second time is now 1 out of 29 if I don't do with replacement, right? Because if I take that student's name out, now you have a 1 out of 29 chance of being chosen. And then it would change to 1 out of 28 and 1 out of 27. So there isn't a constant probability of success, right, in that case. So once you show all those are true, then we can use this binomial probability formula to calculate our probability that x is equal to a certain number of successes. So this is our formula. From n, we're going to choose x. This is another way of writing combinations. So remember, we did this at the end of chapter 5. We did the n choose x. This is just another way to write it. Okay, so combination. Then we do p to the x. So this is the probability of success raised to the number of successes times the probability of failure, which is 1 minus p, raised to the number of failures, right? n minus x would be our number of failures. And that is our binomial PDF formula. You probably won't be doing this by hand a lot because we're going to show how to do it in the calculator, but I do want you to kind of just understand that there is a formula um, be behind what your calculator is doing. This here, we're just showing how, you know, you can, you could use binomial or you couldn't. Okay, so for this one, you can't use the binomial. Uh, it's not a binomial random variable because it fails here. This one, it passes all of them, so you could use the binomial. The mean and standard deviation of a binomial random variable, we just did this uh, for the coin toss experiment uh, when we just knew it was a a probability experiment. We weren't sure if it was binomial. Uh, for that one, you know, we had a little longer formula. Once you know it's binomial, then this is the way you can calculate the mean. You just take n times p, which is pretty simple, right? The standard deviation, you do the square root of n times p times 1 minus p, and that's it. Okay, uh, n is the number of trials, p is the probability of success. So don't forget that because uh, that is important in the PDF and when calculating the mean and the standard deviation. You need to know n and p and then the x that you're trying to calculate for.
Okay, this is um, up here an important little table just to remind you of what all these phrases mean. If I say at least or if I say less than or no more than, you know, all those things, uh, which math symbol we want to use. Okay, so these are the math symbols that we would use there um, and how to equate, you know, going from words uh, to math language. Okay, for a binomial distribution with n equal to 10 and p equal to 0.3, find the probability that x is equal to 2. So what's the probability that in these 10 trials, I would have two successes? Okay, our probability of success is 0.3. So I'm going to plug this in to this formula, and I get this answer, 0.2335. Now the other way I can do this is by using the binomial PDF, and that's in our calculator. So I'm going to go to um, distributions, which is the second variables. And then you see binomial PDF down there. So you have to go down a little bit, uh, but there it is, binomial PDF. When you do the binomial PDF, you're going to put in N, P, and X. Okay, so our N was 10. P is 0.3. And our X for A is 2. Oh, I'm sorry, I put in made a zero there instead of a there we go okay so we put in 10.3 and 2 and then I close my parenthesis and I get 0.2335 which you see is the same thing we got there right 0.2335 so anytime you want to find the probability that x is equal to a certain number, you will use the binomial PDF in your calculator, or you will use the binomial PDF formula here um, and plug in the values. Now here we want to know the probability that x is less than or equal to 2. So if we were to write that out, what does that mean, the probability that x is less than or equal to 2? Well, it means the probability x is equal to 2 plus the probability x is equal to 1, and then plus the probability x is equal to 0, right? So what we could do is we could calculate the PDF for each one of these, which I don't want to do, right? That's going to take a while, especially if we had like the probability x is less than or equal to 6, right? Then we'd have to find 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. You know, that could be very time consuming. So thankfully, we have this other option. We have a binomial CDF. The CDF is talking about the cumulative density function. So what the CDF does is it calculates for this number that you put in and anything less than that, and it adds them all together, okay? So this we're going to have 10.3. And then we're still going to put 2 in here because 2 is still our x value. We're just changing to the CDF because we want to find the probability of any value up to 2, okay, up to and including 2. All right, and we get 0.383, and you see that's the answer we got there. Um, so that's going to be how we'll use the CDF and the PDF. So these are going to be very important to use. Uh, I expect in Chapter 6 you'll probably use these exclusively uh, instead of doing it by hand. Now you can do it by hand if you would like. I just think this is going to uh, save you a lot of time. Okay. So using the PDF and CDF along with the complement rule, you're going to be able to answer any question that you might have. Okay. Because look at this question right here. Now we're looking at the probability that x is greater than or equal to 6. So greater than or equal to 6, we can't use the CDF just based on this because CDF is less than or equal to. So we're looking for greater than or equal to. Greater than or equal to would be the probability that x is equal to 6, 7, 8, 9, or 10, right? So we could calculate the PDFs for each of those and add them up. Or in this one up here for C, 
we calculated the probability that x is less than or equal to 5. The probability that x is greater than or equal to 6 is just the opposite of that, right? You're either 5 or less or 6 or more, right? This is the opposite of that. So this would be, we could use the complement rule and do 1 minus this that we already calculated, which was 0.95. So 1 minus 0.95 gives us 0.05, right? And so that would be our answer. So we can use the PDF for equal to, the CDF for less than or equal to, and then use the complement with the CDF anytime we're doing a greater than or greater than or equal to. And there is um, another handout on Blackboard. Let me see if I've still got that up. Um, let me go to your all's course real quick. And make sure this is on there in the resources area let's see if it's it's probably in calculator tutorials let's go there and see in the calculator tutorials there is um, this binomial PDF CDF uh, just goes through how to do it on your calculator if you wanted to but this is um, a little handout here that's I always hand out to my class it's very helpful it goes through this example um, that I use in my notes but it shows you how to do all this stuff um, on the calculator it shows you little screenshots but this is what I really like at the bottom of page three it shows how how and when to use the PDF or the CDF and you know what to function your calculator what you need to use and so this little chart here is very very informative for chapter six so that was in our resources area um, in the calculator tutorials down there in binomial probabilities okay So this, that O negative blood type problem is the one that follows that handout I was just showing you. So that's how I will do that. These are all just some more examples. And what this is going to show you here is um, as we increase our number of trials, so the N values, notice how this starts to go from skewed to more symmetric, right? So here it's skewed right. Here it's slightly skewed right, and now when we've gotten up to a sample size of about 70, we start to see a much more symmetric shape, right? So what we're going to learn that as our sample size increase or our number of trials increase, when we get to n times p times 1 minus p being greater than or equal to 10, the probability distribution is going to be approximately bell-shaped. And that's going to be very important because that means that once we get to this point, it starts to look like a normal distribution, which is what we're going to use in Chapter 7 um, and moving forward. And so we're going to start looking at how any distribution, as we get a large enough sample size, will start looking like the normal distribution. So this is just a little slide, uh, kind of a preview of coming attractions uh, for the future chapters. But that is the end of Chapter 6, which is the end of Unit 3. So if you have any questions, please be sure to email me at Angela.Galloway, and I'll help you out however I can. Thanks.